This special Tubishvat podcast is dedicated in loving memory and Leilu Nishmas Nachshon Dov Ben Shmuel, whose 25th yard site falls out on this year's Tubishvat. May his soul be elevated in heaven. We have the upcoming minor festival of Tubishvat, the Rosh Hashanah for Trees, in a couple of days. The word tu means 15. It's a tes, which is 9, plus a vav, which is 6. So tu is 15. Bishvat meaning in the 11th month, the month of Shvat. This is a very mysterious day. This is a very Kabbalistic day. This is a very difficult day to penetrate and to try to understand, you know, what does it even mean to have a Rosh Hashanah for trees, for fruits? There are not a whole lot of primary sources on Tubishvat. There are no mitzvos associated with this day. There are, of course, various customs. There's a custom to eat fruits in some communities, it becomes a day to work on the environment, to plant trees and the like. The Kabbalists made it a big day, a big celebration, a big festival. They developed a Seder, just like we have a Pesach Seder. There's a, a system and an organization of how to try to extract the power of Pesach with the Pesach Seder. And they developed a Tubishvat Seder that mirrors the Pesach Seder. They take 10 distinct fruits and they eat them in a certain order, and there's various prayers, various things to ruminate upon. They drink four cups of wine, just like we have the four cups of wine on the Pesach Seder, and through that, they reveal and delve into the secrets and the powers of this day. But what about us? How can we understand what exactly Tu B'Shvat is all about? What does it represent? What does it mean? Where does it come from? What are the ways that we can try to tap into the power of this day. So let's start with the basics. The primary source in the Talmud of the Mishnah that talks about Tu Bishvat, the 15th day of the month of Shvat, is found in the first Mishnah of Rosh Hashanah. The first Mishnah of Rosh Hashanah tells us that there are four days in the year that are called Rosh Hashanahs. The first day of Nisan, the month of Nisan, which is the for the first month of the calendar cycle. Well, that's the Rosh Hashanah for kings, for the monarchy, and for the festivals. Okay. Then we have the first day of Elul, which is uh, the month that comes before Tishrei, before our Rosh Hashanah that we call Rosh Hashanah. And that is the Rosh Hashanah for tithing of animals. And then the first day of Tishrei, which is the day that we call Rosh Hashanah. And that's Rosh Hashanah for years and for Shemitah, which is the seven-year cycle, and the Yovel, the Jubilee, and for planting and for vegetables. And finally, we have the first day of Shvat. That is the Rosh Hashanah for the trees. And that's the opinion of the Academy of Shammai. However, the Academy of Hillel says it's not the first day of Shvat. It's not the first day of the month of Shvat, the 11th month of the year Shvat. No, it is the 15th day of Shvat. So this is the first source. We're told there's four kinds of Rosh Hashanahs, and the Rosh Hashanah, which is the Rosh Hashanah, the, the first of the year, the beginning of the year, the new year of the fruit, according to the opinion of Beis Shammai, it's the first day of the month of Shvat, and according to the opinion of Beis Hillel, it's the 15th day of Shvat. Of course, we always favor Beis Hillel, the Academy of Hillel, over the Academy of Shammai, and therefore, we celebrate the Rosh Hashanah for the new fruits on the 15th day of Shvat, on Tu B'Shvat. What does this even mean on a very basic level? Why do we need to know which day is the cutoff, is the new year for fruits? So the Talmud tells us, and the commentaries all tell us, that there are various laws related to the agricultural laws, like tithing and the like, that relate to fruits and vegetables. You know, if we're in Israel and we plant a tree, there's all kinds of laws that are associated with processing, you know, tithing, giving 10% and the like, and uh, various different tithes you have to give on various different years. And the first three years of a, uh, a tree, those fruits are prohibited. So we have to know what is the cutoff point of, of fruit trees and other things that we plant. We can only tithe, says the Talmud, from fruits of a given year for fruits of a given year. So you have to know when's like the fiscal year of fruits. And therefore, we have to know what's the cutoff. The fruits that develop before this point are associated with the previous years. 
Like the profits of December 31st are associated with the tax year, so to speak, of 2020. And the profits of January 1st are associated with the next year's, the next fiscal year, so to speak. So when's the fiscal year for fruits? Either the first day of the month of Shvat, according to Beis Shammai, or the 15th day of the month of Shvat, according to Beis Hillel, the Academy of Hillel. This seems, of course, very technical, and not very relevant to us, I imagine most of the people listening are not farmers. And even if you are, it's unlikely that you are planting trees in Israel. And maybe there are a couple. But why is it relevant to us? Like like us regular people, what is our way to connect to this day? Or what's this day's power and influence that it can have on us? So we get a few more clues from the halachic literature and the Hasidic and Kabbalistic literature. So the first thing we're told is that this is a minor holiday and therefore there are certain prayers of mourning and of lamentations that we don't do on Tu B'Shvat. And just like we don't do on regular festivals and Rosh Chodesh and Tu B'Av, the 15th day of the month of Av, we don't do it on Tu B'Shvat. And then we find a little bit more. There's a custom to eat fruits on this day. This is the the Rosh Hashanah, the new year for fruits. Okay, they developed a custom to eat fruits. And then finally, we learn about a universal custom to pray. For what? To pray that the upcoming year's esrog or etrog crop produces beautiful fruits. In eight months, exactly eight months, from Tu B'Shvat, the 15th day of Shvat, is the 15th day of Tishrei. And of course, that's the first day of Sukkot. And at Sukkot, we have to take a fruit. That's a esrog, a citron. And we have to do the mitzvah of the four species. And now, it's the holiday. It's the Rosh Hashanah. It's the new year for fruits. So what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to pray that the mitzvah that we do with the fruit, i.e. upcoming in eight months, it should be a really nice fruit. We should get a really beautiful, flawless esrog on the upcoming Sukkot. What does this mean? Why am I praying now for the Esrog to be used in eight months from now on the festival of Sukkot? It's not exactly clear, just from the basic sources, what is significant about this day, what does it mean, and we're going to try today to go a little bit deeper and try to uncover the secret or the secrets of this day and see what it means for us. I want to begin with a little bit of a, of a disclaimer that the ideas that we're going to uncover, I think, are very powerful, but they're a little bit difficult to process. You know, sometimes I feel like when I speak, you can kind of listen with half an air. Oh, and you kind of get the gist. You know, you kind of repeat yourself and you kind of get the idea. But this is a multi-layered, multi-pronged development of understanding what this day actually represents because it's not immediately clear. There's no, there's no easy answer. We really have to drill really deep to find the answer. So the warning or the, the, the disclaimer is we're going to try to identify what this day is about, but there's a lot of maneuvering that we're going to do. Let's begin. So what is the essence of Tu B'Shvat? Now we know that we are, we've been trained already. That if you want to understand the essence of a certain day and the power that it has, you try to find the first version of that day. What was the original day? And then that day will reveal to you what the power of that day is. So for example, Rosh Hashanah, the actual Rosh Hashanah that we call Rosh Hashanah, we blow the shofar, etc. When was the first Rosh Hashanah? So we know that Rosh Hashanah is the anniversary of the creation of Adam. That's day six of creation. The world was created on the 25th day of Elul. That's day one of creation. And day six is the first day of Tishrei, i.e. Rosh Hashanah. And that's when Adam was created. And therefore, the first Rosh Hashanah was the creation of man. And therefore, this day is associated with the renewal of man, the creation of man. Moreover, this was the day that God was coronated as king. Because you can't have a king without a subject. And therefore, Rosh Hashanah is also the anniversary of the dominion of God as king. And of course, the anniversary of mankind. And therefore, everything we do in Rosh Hashanah flows out of that understanding of what that day is. 
So similarly, Pesach, Passover. What was the first Passover? Well, that was the actual anniversary of Exodus. And therefore, that day is propitious for redemption, for salvation. And therefore, that is the day that we were saved. And by the way, the way this is always structured in Jewish philosophy, we don't say that, oh, because we were saved, it's a day of salvation. We say the opposite. Because it was a day of salvation, that's why we could be saved on the Exodus, on Passover. You remember, Lot in Genesis was baking matzah when the angels came to visit him. And that's when they flipped over the city. And Rashi says, why is he baking matzah? Well, it was Pesach, according to the Talmud. But wait a minute, Pesach hadn't happened. The Jewish people hadn't even gone down to Egypt and there wasn't an enslavement and there weren't the plagues and there wasn't the Exodus. So why was there matzah? The answer is that matzah and freedom and redemption was always associated with this day. And that's why this is the day that we could be saved. And that's why this is the day that even in 2021 and 2028, we could still be saved on Pesach. It's a day of liberation, a day of redemption. Shavuos, that's the day that we got the Torah. We stood for the mountain, Mount Sinai. That was the day of revelation, the day of Torah. And therefore, we try to tap into that power with Torah. Yom Kippur, what was the first Yom Kippur? God forgave the Jewish people the sin of the golden calf. Thus, that day is associated with forgiveness, even for the most egregious sins. So the first day that we see something significant happen on a particular festival That reveals to us the inherent power of that day. And therefore, when we revisit that little juncture in in, in the year, when we know what the day is all about, it guides us to understand how to take advantage of that day's opportunities. So when was the first Tubishvat? It's not exactly an easy question to answer. There is no day in the Torah, for example, that we're told, oh, it was the 15th day of the 11th month, i.e. to Bushvat, and this and this happened. If we had that, we would say, okay, that that story is going to reveal to us what's the power inherent in that day. So the Bnei Sashar, one of the great Hasidic uh, books and and masters, he presents a very deep and a multi-pronged calculation that reveals the first to Bushvat. Now, it's very helpful, of course, if we have a little familiarity with the Jewish months, but we'll try to do it uh, nonetheless. He says as follows. We said earlier, Rosh Hashanah, the original Rosh Hashanah, the actual day that we celebrate as Rosh Hashanah, well, that is the day that Adam was created. That's day six of creation. The truth is, the Talmud in the book of Rosh Hashanah, page 10b, going into 11a, tells us that it's a dispute. When was the world created? Was it created in Tishrei? Was Adam created in the first day of Tishrei? Or was Adam created in the month of Nisan, the month that we celebrate, of course, Pesach? Of course, we assume that the world's created in Rosh Hashanah, i.e. on Tishrei. Comes along Rabbi Yoshua in the Talmud and says, no, the world's created in Tishrei. The world's created in Nisan. And again, if we understand the dispute... They're not talking about day one of creation. They're talking about day six of creation, i.e. the creation of Adam. According to one opinion, Adam's created on the first day of Tishrei. And therefore, the world, day one of creation, was the 25th day of Elul, six days beforehand. And according to the second opinion, Adam was created on day one of Nisan, and therefore, day one of creation was the 25th day of Adar, the month that comes before Nisan. Here's where it gets interesting. We have two opinions when the world's created. What's created, 25th day of Elul, day one, and day six is first day of Tishrei. Or what's created day one, first 25th day of Adar, and day six of creation is the first day of Nisan. That's the dispute according to the Talmud. Come along the Kabbalists, and they tell us, actually, this really isn't a dispute. Both opinions are correct. Because the world was created not once, it was created twice. More specifically, 
The world's created on two different dimensions. And if you look at Rashi, if you study Rashi, the very first beginning of, of Genesis, Rashi tells us that the Almighty b'machshava, i.e. in thought, the Almighty intended to create the world with judgment. And then he saw that the world cannot endure with strict judgment. So he came and he added kindness. Of course, this is a difficult thing to process theologically. What does it mean the Almighty thought? And then he changed his mind. What the commentaries explain is that the Almighty created the world twice. One in a machshava, i.e. thought dimension. And that was one, a creation of total judgment. And they might create the world a second time, not just with judgment, but also with mercy, also with kindness associated with it. And these two dimensions of creation, that is the two opinions, so to speak, of when the world is created. So let's break this down. Judgment. When are we judged? We're judged on Rosh Hashanah, i.e. the first day of Tishrei. The creation of the world, b'machshava, i.e., in thought, when it was theoretically, so to speak, in the in the mind of God, whatever that means, it was created with the attribute of, of strict judgment, that was when it was created, b'machshava, in thought, in Tishrei. The first day of creation, in thought, with judgment, was the 25th day of Elul. And day six of creation on the dimension of thought in judgment is the first day of Tishrei, and that's why we were judged on Rosh Hashanah. When was the ultimate creation in practice on the other dimension, well, that was done in Nisan. The 25th day of Adar was the first day of creation in practice with kindness. And the first day of Nisan was the creation of Adam in practice in kindness. And therefore, the month of Nisan is always associated with kindness. Like we have the redemption. We have the Exodus. It's a, always a month of salvation. We're told we're going to be saved again in the month of Nisan. That's the time of the year that's always associated with with kindness. So let's take stock, what we have over here. The 25th day of Elul, beginning of creation, day one of creation, on the thought dimension, with judgment. And then six days later, day six, is the first day of Tishrei, creation of mankind of Adam, again on that dimension, in the thought dimension, with judgment. Fast forward to the 25th day of Adar, And then we have the second dimension of creation beginning, day one of the next dimension of creation, and that is the dimension of creation in practice with kindness, and that's the beginning of creation, day one. First day of Nisan is the creation of man, day six of creation 2.0, creation with kindness, and that's when Adam was created in practice. So we have creation on two dimensions. With judgment, starting on the 25th day of Elul, and with kindness, starting on the 25th day of Adar. There's one more critical piece that we need to see how Tu B'Shvat fits into this. The Talmud tells us that 40 days prior to a child's conception, there is a prophetic voice, a baskol, that declares... Who will be the future mate of this child? What this Talmud reveals is that before the initiation, so to speak, of a thing, like a child, the prophecy already exists foretelling the future actualization, i.e. who will be that child's partner, i.e. who will be that child's partner, even before conception, 40 days prior, we have that prophetic announcement. Reveal to us the Kabbalists. This applies not only to humans, but to everything. Everything that is created 40 days prior, that's when you already have the the prophetic murmuring, shall we say, the prophetic voice, the Vazkal, the clairvoyant future foreknowledge is already set in motion, is already set into place of what is going to be the future actualization of that thing. When was the beginning of the world being created in practice? With kindness. So, of course, we said it's the 25th day of Adar. And then day six of creation of the world in kindness, when Adam is created in practice in kindness, that's on the first day of Nisan. So the beginning of creation 
with kindness is the 25th day of Adar. And we're told that 40 days prior to that, there was already the the murmurings, the prophetic murmurings of that, the future, so to speak, of the thing that's being created. So let's do some math over here. What is 40 days prior to the 25th day of Adar? The answer, of course, is Tu Bishvat. Tu Bishvat is the 15th day of Shvat. If you were to add 10 more days, you have the 25th day of Shvat. And you add 30 more days on top of that, for a total of 40 days, it's the 25th day of Adar, the first day of creation on the dimension of practice, on the dimension of kindness. So what does that reveal to us? Tu Bishvat, the first Tu Bishvat, was the day when there was a prophetic foretelling of a creation of the world in kindness. What is the first indication of kindness? Of course, we have the world being created with judgment on that dimension. And there's just judgment. And then the Almighty says, you know what? I'm going to create the world on a different dimension with kindness. The first, earliest, earliest indication of kindness is 40 days before the actual creation. It's on Tu Bishvat. And by the way, as a quick aside, what's 40 days before the 25th day of Elul? That's another day that we call Tu, i.e. Tu Be'av. But that, of course, is a separate day. This masterful, multi-pronged calculation reveals to us the essence of this day. This day, Tu Bishvat, is special because it is the beginning of kindness being expressed. So what does that mean? Let's get to kind of stage two of this idea. What does it mean that Tu Bishvat is the first expression of kindness? This brings us to our second point. And again, like the first point, it is slightly subtle. The Talmud asks, why is the Rosh Hashanah for trees, why is it in the middle of the winter? It's going to be at the end of the winter, like kind of when the seasonal cycle ends. There's a kind of the winter leading to spring. Why would you have a change, so to speak, in the status of trees in the middle of the winter? Shvat, the month that we're in right now, the month that Tu is in, it's the middle of the winter. It's January season. So according to the opinion of Beishamai, it's the first of Shvat. According to the opinion of Basilel, it is the 15th day of Shvat. But regardless, it's the middle of the winter. Why is this the cutoff for the cycle of the fruit trees? Says the Talmud, the answer has to do with rain. At this point in the calendar, says the Talmud, the majority of the rain cycle has already been done. Either the first or the 15th. And once the rain is finished, the rain is the inputs, so to speak, for the tree's output. And once the inputs are done, the outputs, i.e. the sprouting, the budding of the fruits, begins. That's what the Talmud says. This is the beginning of the budding, of the flowering of the trees. It's not done yet. You you can't eat a fruit yet. But you have a little nub, a little stub, a little beginning, a hint of a beginning for the future fruit to come. Here's another important point. Everything that happens in the physical world is a reflection of what happens in the spiritual world. So we're talking here about physical fruits. And we say that they follow a certain pattern. You have a seed, you put it on the ground, and then there's rain, there's watering. And you wait. And only then, at some point in the middle of the winter... Does anything surface? Does anything sprout? You have all this investment, the time and the seed and the rain, and it doesn't bear any tangible fruit. It doesn't get actualized. You don't see any profits yet. Until Shvat. The work's done underground. It's invisible. You have no tangible benefits. And only in Shvat... Does the investment begin to start paying off? 
do you start to get an inkling? Oh, all this work was for something tangible. That's what we see with the physical fruits. The spiritual fruits follow the same pattern. If you want to bear spiritual fruits, you also have to plant the seed. You have to put in the effort and you're not going to see the results right away. You plant the seed, you got to water the area, you got to wait and you have to let things develop. Let things germinate. And now in the month of Shvat, Tu B'Shvat, the first day of Shvat, now is the time to start seeing the little spiritual buds start to be unearthed. Now is the part of the year when all the effort begins to pay off. So let's try to put Tu B'Shvat in the big picture of the whole year. Rosh Hashanah is the day of judgment. What happens to us, of course, on a physical level, but also on a spiritual level, in the upcoming year is going to be determined. And we have 10 days to maybe adjust with that, maybe fix it, repent. Yom Kippur is the ceiling. And of course, we learned it's not really the ceiling. We have the ability to retract it, to undo it. We have Hoshana Rabbah. And we have Shemini Atzeres. What do we pray in Shemini Atzeres, the last day of Sukkot? We start praying for rain. And of course, of course, like everything, if we're praying for physical rain, we're also praying for spiritual rain. What this means is, is that on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, what happens to us or what's going to happen to us on a physical plane and on a spiritual plane is going to be allocated. It's going to be designated for us. But we haven't yet pocketed it yet. It's not within our grasp yet. There's the next phase of the year is the watering phase, is the rain phase, where all the blessings that we were allocated in Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur they need to be developed, and it's all on the ground. Shvat, this month that we're in right now, that's when we start to see a little bit of the kindness, a little bit of the blessings coming to the surface. And again, it's just the very beginning. It's like the 40 days before the actualization. But now there's a shift. And what happens then? This shift intensifies, and... The kindness increases. And then we get to the end of Adar and it really hits its stride. And then we get to the month of Nisan. And the Nisan is a whole month totally dedicated towards kindness and blessing. And slowly our fruit, of course the physical fruit, but the spiritual fruit as well, is unearthed. And then we have Shavuot. Shavuot, that's a time of of reaping, of harvesting. And in the temple, there was a mitzvah starting with Shavuot, to take the fruits and bring it to the temple, take the first fruits, the Bikur, and bring it to the temple and to thank God for them. This is the time where all the investments that we started off with on Rosh Hashanah are finally in our hands. But even then, we cannot be sure that it is ours to keep forever. Because you know what? We could still lose it. We have some turbulent months, tamas of really difficult months at the end of the year. And only once we initiate the following year and we still are holding those fruits and we take our proverbial esrod, the fruit that was planted last year, and we take it on Sukkot and we shake it, we do a mitzvah with it, only then can we be guaranteed that our efforts paid off. Only then can we be assured that the spiritual fruits of the previous year indeed are ours forever. We've acquired them. We've integrated them. So why are we praying for an esrog on Tu B'Shvat? Again, on a simple level, well, now is the time for trees. Let's think about trees. What we could do with fruits? That's, of course, the simple level. But kind of understanding the spiritual nature of this day, this is the beginning of the flowering both of physical fruits and of spiritual fruits, and we want to make sure already at the very beginning that the end, so to speak, is secure. The beginning of the budding of our spiritual fruits is a time for us to think about the ultimate destination and pray and hope that indeed we are able to actualize it. Let's take this idea 
a little bit further. The month of Shvat appears once in the Torah. In the third verse of Deuteronomy, it tells us, it was on the 40th year of the Exodus, on the 11th month. Nisan, Iyar, Sivan, Tammuz, Av, Elul, Tishrei, Cheshvan, Kislev, Tevis, Shvat, the 11th month. Adar is the last month, the 12th month. And then it starts again. It was on the 40th year, on the 11th month, on the first day of the month, and that's when Moshe started giving the Jewish people the Mishnah Torah, the Deuteronomy, the repetition of Torah. And what happened? So we read, Be'ever Hayardain, on the other side of the Jordan, Be'eretz Moab, in the land of Moab, Ho'il Moshe. Moshe started Be'er es HaTorah Hazos, to explain this Torah. The book of Deuteronomy, where Moshe is explaining to us the Torah, that is kick started in the month of Shvat, on the first day of the month. And what does Moshe do? He explains to us the Torah. Says Rashi, what does that mean? He reveals the Torah to us in 70 languages. What this means is that the Torah, of course, existed in the spiritual realm, the spiritual dimension. And on that level, it's totally incomprehensible to us. We're not angels. We can't study the Torah of the heavens. But what did Moshe do? Moshe took the heavenly Torah and was able to filter it and translate it to us in 70 languages, meaning that every human, no matter what language they come from, they're able to process and understand and integrate and absorb the lessons of Torah. So, of course, Moshe taught Torah prior. But it was hidden. It was obscure. It was still captured in the spiritual world of the heavens. We call that the written Torah. For us, for simple people here, it was still hidden. And on the first day of Shvat, in a season where themes sprout and surface, that is when the Torah was translated into 70 languages, i.e. into our frames of reference. That's when it started clicking, so to speak, for us. That's when it started to make sense to us. And it started on the first day of Shvat. So it comes along the Academy of Shammai, and they say, wait a minute. When are all the things that were latent, potentially, so to speak, inherent within us, but not revealed, when did that actually get started? It was the first day of Shvat. Look at Deuteronomy. The first day of Shvat, Moshe started to explain the Torah to us in 70 languages. The things that were potential became actualized. And by the way, have you ever heard the term Ha'adam Eitz Hasadeh? Man is like a tree, a tree of the field. The commentary is explained to us. We're like a tree, but an upside down tree. A physical tree has its roots in the ground. And then the trees and the branches come out above the ground. We have our roots in the heaven. We're like a tree suspended upside down. Our roots, our essence, so to speak, is rooted in the heavens. Our roots really know Torah. But so to speak, our revealed part is here in this world, the upside down tree. And when did the, so to speak, flowering buds of Torah begin to surface in this world in 70 languages in a way that we can understand? Say Be Shammai, say the Academy of Shammai. Well, when did Moshe start explaining the Torah? When did the, so to speak, revelation of the spiritual roots that we have in heaven, when did it start to surface in this world? When did it bud and sprout on the first day of Shvat? That's when the Rosh Hashanah four fruits are. That's when the actualization of what was previously invisible to us, that's when it began. And the Academy of Hillel, they actually agree in principle. Indeed, the transition to this period was already present on the first day of Shvat. But it was faint. Moshe started to explain the Torah. Beishamai, the Academy of Shammai, were told in the Talmud, they were more spiritually sharper than the Academy of Hillel. They had more spiritual sensitivity. 
And therefore, on the first day of Shvat, they could already sense how the flowering, so to speak, the revelation of the fruits of Torah were already present day one of Shvat. But the halacha follows the Academy of Hillel. The common folk, they didn't pick up on this, so to speak, kindness, this revelation, until the 15th day of Shvat. And therefore, they revealed to us that the more appreciable change happened halfway through the month of Shvat, i.e. on Tu B'Shvat. Now, if you have a precise reading of the Mishnah that we started with, the Mishnah indicates that there's actually not a fundamental disagreement between the Academy of Shammah and the Academy of Hillel. Why? How does it start? The first day of Shvat is Rosh Hashanah for trees. Kedivrei Beishamai. Like the words of Beishamai. However, Beis Hillel says, the Academy of Hillel says, no, it's the 15th day. Normally, when there's a dispute, it says, well, what's the halacha? They say X, they say Y. Or, these are the words of Shammai, and the Hillel disagrees. This is the only place, to my knowledge, in all of Talmud, where a disagreement presented between the Academy of Shammai and the Academy of Hillel is presented in this fashion. Like the opinion of Beis Shammai, it's X, and like the opinion of Hillel, it's Y. Meaning it's true for both of them, but you have to be really spiritually sensitive, like the Academy of Shammai, to pick up on this change in what's happening in the spiritual world on the first day of Shvat. According to the Academy of, of Hillel, you have to wait till it really begins to express itself when it really begins to sprout and flourish, and that's on the 15th day of Shvat. So what's the bottom line? I feel like we have a sense of what this day is really about. Tu B'Shvat is the transition and the fruit. Everything that happened, the water, all the things that happen underneath the ground to facilitate the growth that was all previously invisible to us. It was all within. It was all maybe in theory. It was like a seed. And then at this point in time, that's when there's a transition. It starts to express itself outside. It becomes visible. In practice, there's a little bit of a fruit, a nub, if you will, that begins to surface. And of course, that's true on the physical world, the physical plane. It's also true in the spiritual world. We have spiritual bounties since Rosh Hashanah that begin to surface now. We went through the planting seed, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, that whole festival period. You put the seed, so to speak, the spiritual seed in the ground. And there was the watering phase, and now is the very beginning of the sprouting phase. This is when the spiritual blessings begin to flower. And this is what it means, that this is the first expression of kindness. Kindness is not when something is good, but when something can be appreciably good, when something can be witnessed and testified to as being good. When they might have created the world with judgment, it was also good, but it was good that we couldn't really recognize it's good. Kindness is when even we can sense that it's good. We sense in Shvat that the blessings begin to surface and to sprout. And this is, of course, 40 days before the kindness really begins in earnest. Of course, the full-blown version of this kindness does not happen till Nisan, but it already begins in Shvat. So, for example, in the month of Nisan, the Exodus happened, Passover happens. That's when the Exodus happened. But what preceded the Exodus? It was preceded by 10 plagues. Well, when did the plagues begin? You guessed it. The plagues began in Shvat. The very beginning of the Exodus, the very beginning of the kindness was in Shvat. This is the month when the transition happens. When you see nothing and you start to see the faint outline of the revelation and of the kindness. The blessings that were subterranean, hard for us to appreciate, they start to bubble to the surface, and we can start to perceive a little bit of the kindness. Of course, it doesn't reach a climax until Nisan, and only on Shavuos do we reap it, and only if we go through the tough months of Thomas and Av can we be assured that we can take our spiritual fruit and bring it into the next year. So what do we do on this day? In the beginning of kindness, 
we pray for the end. We pray for the esrog. Of course, on one level, it means the physical fruit, but on a deeper level, it refers to the spiritual fruit of this year. The spiritual gifts that we were allocated on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur are now beginning to sprout. And next year we will know if we acquire them forever. It's time to pray now for the esrog. When Abraham enters the land of Canaan, the very first thing that he does, this is in Genesis chapter 12, verse 6, Abraham traverses the land until Shechem. And he goes from there to Elon Moreh. Says Rashi, what's he doing there? First thing, again, the very first thing that he does after he enters, he goes to Shechem, says Rashi, to pray for the sons of Jacob. They're going to have a very eventful encounter in Shechem. Abraham comes to pray for them. Oh, and why does he go to Elon Moreh? He goes there to kind of set the stage for what's going to happen to the nation after they enter the land with Joshua. They're going to go half of them onto Mount Rezim, half of them onto Mount Abel, blessings and curses. Abraham is going to lay the spiritual groundwork for that. The first two things that Abraham does once in Canaan, at the very beginning of his tenure as, so to speak, the forbearer of the chosen people, is to pray for his grandchildren. Again, he doesn't even have any children yet. And he's already praying for his grandchildren. And he's already thinking about the nation. He's already thinking about what's going to be the nation is already comprised of millions of people and they've gone through hundreds of years of servitude, enslavement in Egypt and they're going to have Moses and have Revelation and have Sinai, have 40 years in the wilderness, cross over the Jordan with Joshua and really establish the enduring settlement of land of Canaan. I'm starting settlement of land of Canaan now as an individual, just Abram. What do I want to do? I want to set the groundwork for the full-blown implementation and actualization of the settlement of Canaan. What does Abraham do when he has a little nub, shall we say, of the fruit, so to speak, of the land of Canaan? He prays for the Esrog. He prays for the time where that little nub has been totally actualized and he's praying at the very beginning to hope and beseech God that the end is indeed done on secure footing. Tu B'Shvat is when the sprouting starts. It's a nub, it's a bud. It's the first sign of life. And what do we think about? What are we praying for? The Esrog, when the nub matures into a full fruit and is being used for its ultimate purpose, at the very beginning, we are already thinking about the ultimate conclusion. Moreover, the beginning determines the end. It's a very interesting teaching in the Talmud that's such a mind-blowing story and there's so many interesting points about it, so I'll just go through it quickly because it really reinforces this idea. This is from the Talmud of Amitzia on page 85b. So just the setting is just kind of really mind-blowing. It's telling us that Reish Lakish, one of the sages of the Talmud, he was demarcating burial sites. He was able, via his powers, his Kabbalistic powers, to be able to sense where a certain sage was buried. Obviously, they didn't dig him up. They didn't exhume the bodies. He was able to just sense there was more spirituality. Well, there's always more spirituality when there is the body, the deceased body of, of a righteous person. So he was able to walk around and say, oh, I sense that a great sage is over here and I sense that a great sage is over there. And that's what he was doing. And he was trying to find the cave in which Rav Chia was buried. And he couldn't find the cave. And he starts praying. He says, wait a minute. I I didn't study Torah like Rav Chia Why is he so elusive? Why can't I sense where his presence is felt? So the heavenly response came back to him. You did study Torah like Rav Chia. But you know what you didn't do? You didn't teach Torah like Rav Chia. You didn't disseminate Torah like Rav Chia. And therefore, he's so above you, you can never figure out where he's buried. 
what was so special about the teaching of the Torah of, of Rav Chia? So the Talmud says that he was the one who was responsible the Torah would never be forgotten. He was such a powerful disseminator of Torah, he was the one who made sure the Torah would never be forgotten. It would endure. What did he do? So he would go and sow and plant flax seeds. And he would take the plant, the, the flax seed and, and spin them into nets. And he would take those nets and trap deer. And he would slaughter the deer. And he would take the meat. Of course, deer is kosher. He takes the meat and gives it to poor people. And then he takes the hide. And he prepares the hide to be used as writing Torah scrolls. And he personally writes Torah scrolls. And then he goes to a city and he teaches five students. Each one of them, he teaches them one book of the Torah. Five books of the Torah, Genesis all the way through Deuteronomy. Each one of the five students teaches them one. And then he finds six other students and says, I'm going to teach each one of you one of the six orders of Mishnah. And then he says, you know what? I'm going to go to a different city, but each one of you is responsible to make sure that everyone else knows your portion. So if you were taught Leviticus, you have to teach everyone in this cohort Leviticus. If you were taught a certain order of Mishnah, you got to teach it to everyone. You guys teach each other until I come back. And he went from city to city following this process until Torah was restored to Jewish people. The commentaries explain is what Rav Chia was, was doing he was the master disseminator of Torah because he's always focusing on the end at the very beginning. The earliest preparation was done under his auspices with total holiness. He could have just went and bought Torah scrolls, but no, he wrote them himself. He could have bought hides to write the Torah scrolls, but no, he trapped the animals and slaughtered it himself. He didn't even buy the nets to trap the deer, to use their hides, he said, I'm going to plant it all myself. Essentially, he made sure, or what this story teaches, is that the earliest, earliest, earliest beginnings, that's the time to make sure that everything is set, so to speak, on the right course. It's like a, you know, like a spaceship, a rocket ship. You know, you want to make sure at the very beginning, you're perfectly aligned where you need to go, because if you're a half an inch off, it could be hundreds of millions of miles away from your ultimate destination. There's a modern example of, of this. Uh, Reb Chaim Velazhiner, who founded the first modern yeshiva in the early 19th century, the legend is told that he cried bitter tears of prayer at the ceremony of laying the cornerstone for the yeshiva. He said a yeshiva can only be built if the earliest beginning of the process is done with prayer and dedication and with noble intentions. Let's translate this idea to Tubishvat. What determines what kind of ultimate outcome we will get? What determines what kind of proverbial esrog we will reap? Of course, the very, very, very beginning. And that, of course, is Tubishvat. It's like a seed. Every seed is different. But whatever is in the seed determines what will be manifested in the resultant tree. You want to make sure that the seed is healthy and robust and everything's done properly. And Tubishvat is the seed, if you will, of the next phase of the sprouting of the blessings of the fruit. It's the first step in the actualization of the fruit of the esrog, of the spiritual qualities that we hope to take into the next year. What's going to last from this year? What's going to endure from this year? That question, that process starts on Tubishvat. Tubishvat is the proverbial laying of the cornerstone of the actualization of what we've earned this year. And therefore, it's really imperative to start off on the right foot. So what do we do? What do we focus on to make sure that we begin to see the fruits of our labor and that we acquire the spiritual takeaways that endure, that we earn the proverbial S-roads that last until next year. So what are the customs of Tubishvat? So we eat fruits, maybe we plant some trees. 
How does that influence us spiritually? How does it, how does that get us in the right mode to begin this phase of the year? So like we said, Adam eats hasadeh. Man is like a tree of the field. This principle, of course, contains all kinds of wisdom. We're a tree, but we're an upside down tree. Our roots are in heaven. And the things that surface are here, but sometimes we forget where our roots are. And we kind of dissociate ourselves from heaven, and then the tree dies. So the first thing we have to think about, maybe it's something we have to think about every day, is to remember that we have a soul, and that's our spiritual roots. And that soul, so to speak, is still rooted in heaven. And if we get, so to speak, the budding of our spiritual fruit kind of kick-started, on that note, we're in good shape for this upcoming season to make sure we reap the proper S road, so to speak, at year's end. There's another very powerful thing to ruminate upon on Tubishvat. This whole agricultural process really embodies the challenge and the struggle of our lives. You have a seed. That gives you options. It gives you a choice. What's the choice? Well, you could eat the seed and you could eat it. You could enjoy it. And then you lose it. Or you could hit the seed and plant it and invest it. And you have to have some patience to work with it. And that hopefully creates fruits. And the fruits themselves contain seeds. And that could create more fruits. And so on. With one seed, you could have a little moment of pleasure. Or you could have billions, exponential growth of future trees. You have the choice of consuming the potential, the opportunity here and now and losing it forever. Or you can invest it in a pattern of endless and eternal, never-ending, exponential growth. You could squander it or you could invest it. What we do with our lives is the same question of what we do with the seed, the opportunity. We could get into a mode of consumption. Everything we have, try to consume it and get the pleasure right away. You know who made that mistake? That's Adam's mistake, right? What did Adam do? He took the fruit and he ate it. And our objective to try to undo, so to speak, the sin of Adam is to take the fruit, take the seed and plant it. Of course, the most powerful and consequential seed that we have is our reproductive seed. It creates the most stark choice that we have. Do we waste the seed for quick, easy pleasure? Or do we implant the seed and try to create humanity? We're creating the image of God. We have some godly characteristics to us. Just as God created man, we too were given the seed to create man. But the Yetzirah says, no, you got to waste that. Our life is opportunity. It's all seeds. And every one of these creates a choice that we have to make. What are we going to do with the seeds? Our time is a seed. We could waste it watching Netflix and football and arguing about politics. We could waste it or we could invest it. We could study Torah. We could try to help others. We could try to volunteer. We could try to do kindness. We could try to make sure that our time is allocated to a more productive planting kind of opportunity. Our resources are seeds. And we get the choice. Do we want to take that and invest and compound and compound, and everyone knows the secret of wealth, of achievement, is compounding. Or do we get into the mode of consumption and just enjoy them? Oh, and by the way, what's the result of our life? The result of our life is also like a seed. We're put into the ground. Says the Talmud. 
you, the totality of your accomplishments creates a seed and that's put into the ground. And the nature of that seed, i.e. the nature of the choices you've made in your life is going to determine what will emerge with the resurrection. Our life is all about thinking the future, trying to plant, invest, and only reap later and not cash in too early. Burial is the ultimate planting, and what will emerge from that is going to be just a manifestation of what went in. So in conclusion, we've discovered that Tubishvat is a lot more than worrying about climate change and the environment and offsetting our carbon footprint. It's not just the Jewish Earth Day. It's a day with deep, mystical, very hard to figure out, hidden, secret meanings and roots. We're told it's the beginning of kindness. It's 40 days prior to the creation of the world with kindness. It's when the kindness of the exodus began. It's the kindness of the sprouting of the fruits, both the physical fruits and the spiritual fruits. And we want spiritual fruits that last. We want to take an esrog, so to speak, a mitzvah that we've accomplished this year, into next year. We want to earn it. We want it to be ours. We want to acquire it. And the seed of that, of course, is Rosh Hashanah Kippur, the beginning of the year. That's when we have the potential of the fruits. Now is the beginning of the actualization of that potential. Tu is the day when it starts in earnest. And our job is to make sure that this day, this process, shall we say, begins with prayer and preparation for the ultimate conclusion of this process. It's a day that we remember the process of spiritual flourishing is akin to that of a tree. You got to seed it. You got to water it. You have to have time and patience. And only then do you see a small sapling. The roots, of course, are taking hold underground. But all you have is a little bud, a little blossom. And much, much later, you have a fruit. And even when you have a fruit, you can lose it. You have to endure some stormy months before you can know that you can keep it. And we hope that indeed we begin this process of reaping the fruits on Tu Bishvat, and we hope that we can kickstart the season of kindness with prayer for the Esrog, for the spiritual fruits to endure, and we emerge from this time with a keen understanding of who we are, of what we're here for, and a deep recognition that life is a seed we must think long and hard about what we want to do with that opportunity. As always, my email address is rabbiwalbajima.com. I look forward to hearing your questions, your comments, and your feedback of all sorts.